Washington Journal continues. Lawrence Wright is a staff writer with the New Yorker magazine. In last week's issue, he writes about Ayman al-Zawahiri. And in the article, uh, Mr. Wright writes, one line of thinking proposes that America's tragedy on September 11th was born in the prisons of Egypt. What do you mean by that? Well, Ayman al-Zawahiri and a number of the other um, Islamists in Egypt were rounded up after the assassination of Sadat in 1981. And they were uh, apparently subjected to really appalling torture. Uh, it seems to be a theme in Egyptian prisons that uh, they're beaten with cables, uh, they are, have their hands sort of handcuffed behind them, and then they're hung on doors with their hand, by their hands and left for long periods of time, and sometimes thrown into, uh, you know, into cells with um, vicious dogs. And uh, this kind of treatment, um, seems to have changed the movement. Before 1981, there was an Islamic movement in Egypt, but it was not near as violent as it became when these people came out of prison. Something transforming happened in those Egyptian prisons. And uh, Ayman al-Zawahiri was in Egyptian prison? Yeah, he was there for three years, uh, 1981 to 1984. Why? He was one of the people that was caught in this dragnet uh, of people rounded up uh, in connection with the Sadat assassination. He was on trial with more than 300 other people. And eventually, after three years, he was found guilty of possessing a gun and sentenced to three years in prison, which he had already served. But the trial itself took three years. Now, how today would most Americans know who Ayman al-Zawahiri is? He's the number two man. He's bin Laden's uh, lieutenant. He's the guy, the doctor, that you always see over uh, bin Laden's shoulder. And uh, he's the, um, many people think, the brains behind the operation. Where did he grow up and how did he grow up and how did that influence him? Well, he grew up in a very middle class neighborhood called Mahdi, right uh, outside of Cairo. And it's a very beautiful neighborhood. Uh, it was created uh, at the turn of the 20th century by uh, Jewish uh, uh, developers, and it was a very cosmopolitan, uh, upper-class neighborhood. He kind of grew up on the opposite side of the tracks in that particular neighborhood, however, and uh, was never really on the inside. But it was... Um, I think not at all the kind of neighborhood you would think uh, that a terrorist or anyone who was anti-American would come from. It was, you know, very much an American compound in some ways. I used to live in Egypt 30 years ago, and I would play tennis at the Mahdi Club occasionally. And and what influenced him then to uh, join the Islamic Jihad, or to form the Islamic Jihad? Right. Uh, he he had. Um, his family was very distinguished to begin with, and on his mother's side, the Azam family, a uh, very radical side of the family, They've, his uncle, uh, Mahfouz Azam, was, uh, when he was a young man, when he was 15, was rounded up at, after an assassination attempt on the Egyptian prime minister. So there was already this kind of violent um, uh, political action in, in, the, uh, in the family. Mahfouz Azam, uh, was the lawyer for Said Qutb, who was the kind of philosopher king of the Islamic movement. He was uh, arrested by Nasser in 1960, in 1960 and hung in 1966. And he uh, wrote a book called Milestones, which is the book that uh, all this goes back to. You know, this is the book that influenced all these people. And the year that, uh, that Nasser had him hanged, um, young Ayman al-Zawahri, 15 years old, created this cell in his high school to overthrow the Egyptian government. And uh, go back to uh, this gentleman again. I want to make sure I'm saying his name right. Sayyid Qutb. Qutb. Mm -hmm. And again, who was he? Sayyid Qutb was a literary critic, uh, and he worked in the Ministry of Education. And in 1948, he came to America. He went to Greeley, Colorado, where uh, he studied for two years. And uh, it's, it's interesting because, you know, we're always asking, you know, why do they hate us so much and how could they have lived among us and, and turned against us? This was the first example of someone who came to America, actually a fan of American movies and American literature, 
arrived and became so disillusioned by what he saw as the kind of spiritual wasteland and the materialism and so on in Greeley, Colorado in 1948, that uh, he rediscovered himself as a radical Muslim, returned to Egypt and uh, began, uh, uh, began his writings against America. And it was very influential in the Muslim world at that time, which largely idolized America up until then. And uh, I want to let our viewers know the lines are up on the screen if you'd like to join our conversation with Lawrence Wright, 202-585-3880. Uh, for Democrats, I'm sorry, 202-585-3881 for Democrats, 202-585-3880 for Republicans, and 202-585-3882 for all others. We'll begin taking your calls in just a few minutes. Um, what was, uh, why was um, uh, Saeed Qutb's book banned in Egypt? Well, it was very radical, and uh, he divided the world into, you know, the world of Islam and the world of Jahiliya, which in, in, in Islamic terms means this kind of world of ignorance and sin that existed before Muhammad received his divine prophecies. He said that the, there is no true Islam yet, and that even countries that are nominally Islamic, such as Egypt or Saudi Arabia, are living in this world of ignorance and sin, and therefore are subject to jihad, to being overthrown by uh, radical Muslims, and so that they could establish the kind of state that they believe is pure Islam, something that was reflected in like the sixth century. And so he was supportive of overthrowing the Egyptian government or the, by any the moderate. Means, by any means. And we, as he said, the bloody instrument of jihad. How did the Egyptian government uh, react to that? Was there a king when he came back? Yes, there was when he came back in 1950. And Nasser overthrew the king in 1952. And it initially... Said Khutab was a great supporter of the revolution, but he and Nasser had different visions about the future of Egypt. Nasser was much more of a secular socialist, and Said Khutab wanted an Islamic state. And how did Nasser treat Khutab? Originally, he put him uh, in charge of this uh, Muslim Brothers magazine. There was, he w Kutub actually had an office in uh, the Revolutionary Council. I mean, he was a close advisor to, to Nasser. But the, 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 the contradictions in what they saw as the future of Egypt uh, eventually separated these men. And Nasser, uh, there was an attempt on his life in 1954. And at that point, he rounded up all these Islamists. An attempt put, by the Muslim Brotherhood? By the Muslim Brotherhood. And uh, he imprisoned many of them, including Said Khutb. And at that point, uh, Khutb's writing took a sharper turn towards uh, radicalism. And the, the result of that was this book called Milestones, which was unbelievably influential uh, in terms of uh, shaping the thoughts of many young Muslims in the Arab world. And after Nasser, uh, President Sadat was president of Egypt for 10 That's years. That's correct. And what was his relationship with the Muslim Brotherhood? How did he kind of treat them? Well, Sadat wanted to establish his own political legacy and separate himself from Nasser. So uh, Nasser had uh, repressed the Muslim Brotherhood, and many of them were in prison. Thousands were in prison. And Sadat freed them. And he thought he had an, an understanding with them, uh, that he would create a more um, a climate of greater liberty concerning religious practices in Egypt. He himself was a very devout and pious man. But... Um, he didn't realize the danger that uh, these people would pose to his own regime. He thought his own piety would protect him. But uh, they had a very distinctive agenda that uh, Sadat was not living out. And Sadat was assassinated by? Yeah. He was assassinated by a small group of jihad people, that uh, the same organization that Ayman al-Zawahri is a member of. and. Uh, uh, Lieutenant Khaled Islambouli was the actual assassin, but it's a small cell inside Cairo, uh, mainly military people. And um, in October 1981, there was a military parade, uh, and um, Sadat you know, was standing uh, in review as the parade passed by, and then suddenly one of these cars swerves over to the stand and uh, 
grenades are thrown into the reviewing stand, and uh, and it, Lieutenant Islam Bouli jumps out with his machine gun and empties it into uh, Sadat, who is. It's amazing to see Sadat standing at attention while this happens. Now, everybody else is uh, diving for cover, but uh, he stands there until he's dead. It, so, how does Al Zawahiri get from uh, the plot to assassinate Sadat to Osama bin Laden's associate? Well, he, even before uh, the assassination, Zawahiri had gone to Pakistan to work in the Red Cross, the Red Crescent Society. And uh, he may have met bin Laden as early as 79 or 80 when he first went there. But after he got out of prison in 1985, he went to Riyadh, uh, to, excuse me, to Jeddah, where bin Laden was living at that time. And later that same year, he went to Peshawar, where uh, bin Laden was going back and forth raising money for the cause. They probably would have met at that time. And um, at that time, Zawahri was 30 four years old, um, and bin Laden was 28, a young and impressionable man. Um, Zawahri was a hardened convict, uh, had uh, formed his views in prison, you know, he had been hammered into this, uh, this very, very strongly um, Islamic-oriented propagandist, and uh, he saw Osama bin Laden with all of his money and with all of his potential as the future of the Islamic movement. And he set out to surround this young man and capture him. First call up for Lawrence Wright, Allentown, Pennsylvania. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, first, let me say, thank you for pronouncing nuclear correctly. <laughs> uh, thank you. I'm so tired of hearing nuclear from people who should know better, like the Secretary of the Navy. Okay, uh, my question is about uh, Dr. Zawahri. Um, He's a doctor, uh, and I understand that uh, bin Laden has health problems. Is he a medical doctor, uh, and uh, is that uh, one of the reasons? Does he serve double duty to uh, bin Laden and his organization? Yeah, he was a surgeon, and um, he, uh, you know, bin Laden had chronic health problems. It's not exactly clear uh, what all of them were. You know, we've heard many times about his kidney problems, for instance, and yet the, the man that's responsible for starting that uh, idea that bin Laden had kidney problems told me that uh, he never observed that. But he did have low blood pressure, for instance, and he would often faint during uh, these battles. They would, uh, you know, in, in, in Afghanistan, he would have to get uh, transfusions of glucose and um, Zawahri would treat him. And he also may have had uh, some other kinds of, such as Marfan syndrome, you know, that's common with really tall people. Uh, we don't know all the kinds of problems, but it's clear that he needed the attendance of a doctor, and, and Zawahri uh, uh, supplied his medical attention as far as we know. You used the past tense when you talked about Osama bin Laden. Do you think he's dead? I think he's dead, but I have no inside information about it. What about Ayman al Zawahri? Uh, Zawahri got married last uh, week uh, to two widows. This is what I'm told. Uh, at least these are the fundamentalists that I've spoken to say that uh, two uh, widows of a comrade that uh, was killed uh, in during the American bombing in the fall. Uh, he summoned them to see that you know they would marry him, and they agreed. And uh, after a three-month journey, wherever he is, uh, they are now uh, Mrs. Zawahri's. New York City. Good morning. Morning. Yes. Given that you think that Osama is dead and Zawahri is married, uh, do you think the threat from Al Qaeda is now receded, or do you think that they are still as ambitious? as they're made out to be, and do you think that they're pragmatic enough to team up with Saddam, um, even though he's a secular leader, and, um, you know, to team up with a, a state-sponsored terror, and uh, thank you for taking my call. Sure. Uh, let me say this. I, first of all, I don't know that bin Laden is dead, but uh, if he is dead, that's an irreplaceable loss. Uh, the charismatic leadership that he provided and the money and the connections uh, is, is, you know, unprecedented. However, that said, there still is a, a widespread network around the world and many capable people such as Ayman al-Zawahri who are still in charge. And um, as for Iraq, I... 
I don't know. I mean, it, there are rumors that uh, Zawahiri himself went to Iraq in the early 80s. Uh, bin Laden supposedly met with Saddam, according to Saddam's mistress. Um, so there, I think that bin Laden has certainly shown himself to be pragmatic, although every fundamentalist will tell you that he despises, that bin Laden despises Saddam and would have nothing to do with him. So, um, and yet he has. So the, you, you can take that for what it's worth. Do you know why he would uh, despise Saddam? Saddam is a secular leader, and he's never imposed a Sharia, which is Islamic law. It's a fundamental thing that the Islamists are seeking: is they want to uh, to impose the rule of Islamic law in, in throughout the Arab world. And um, Saddam has not done that, and has shown really no inclination to do it. You tell a story in, in your article about uh, Ayman Al Zawari imposing Sharia um, yeah. on some young young boys. This is a really uh, savage story. The um, Egyptian intelligence had penetrated uh, in Sudan, where Zawahri and bin Laden were living in the early 90s. Um, and they formed a spy network composed of children, young boys, that they, uh, they seduced, essentially, drugged, uh, sodomized, and videotaped and then threatened with blackmail uh, to expose them to their own fathers. Um, and these boys became the nucleus of a network in the Sudan and turned out to be a very productive network for the Egyptian intelligence. Uh, at one point, the Egyptians decided that they wanted to go ahead and kill Zawahri and they knew where he was going to meet. And they gave one of these boys, who was about 13 or 14 years old, a suitcase full of explosives. The Sudanese intelligence had by now figured that something was going on and they caught this boy with the explosives in hand and uh, put him in jail. Zawahri asked for uh, this boy and another one that had been captured by the Sudanese uh, simply to question them, he said. And uh, what he did was put them on trial uh, in a Sharia court um, for treason and then execute them. Uh, videotape their confessions and their execution and have them widely circulated as a warning to anyone that, um, that might uh, try the same thing. And this became a very divisive uh, action within the Islamic community because it seemed uh, really cruel. Um, and Zawahri complained, we were only uh, imposing Sharia. And if we can't impose it on ourselves, you know, we don't have the right to do it with anyone else. The Sudanese took a very dim view of this, and uh, because, you know, they were already under pressure from the Americans and the Saudis to get rid of these guys, so they, they decided to throw them out. Next call for Lawrence Wright, Cincinnati. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Peter, and good morning, Mr. Wright. I'm a subscriber to The New Yorker, and I read your article, and I found it very, very informative. And your article just reinforces my feelings about Mr. Bush's planned invasion of Iraq. I feel that to rush in and invade Iraq might well play into the hands of al-Qaeda. Imagine a scenario where Mr. Bush invades Iraq, uh, elements of al-Qaeda and other Islamist groups based in Pakistan decide to launch a series of terrorist attacks on India. This prompts India to declare war on Pakistan a nuclear exchange follows where, say, the city of Karachi is bombed. Mass chaos ensues. Uh, other fundamental Islamists in Egypt decide this is a good time to overthrow Hosni Mubarak's government. The Palestinians are in thus emboldened to even further their attacks against Israel, and it just degenerates from there. Uh, any comments that you might have, I'll take off the air. Thank you. Sure. I, I'm not a global political strategist, so I'm not going to be able to help you very much with that. But I don't think that, I mean, the situation is degenerating as fast as it possibly can under any circumstances. And uh, I don't know that war is going to affect it uh, positively or negatively. It's, uh, it's a, we're in an incredibly volatile situation in the Middle East right now. Um, let's go back to his point about Iraq. Um, mm -hmm. Did you see any proof that Ayman al Zawari uh, was in contact with Iraq and was his uh, get there? Well, there was an article previously in the New Yorker, I think in 
February by Jeff Goldberg about the Kurds. And uh, in, while he was there, uh, he ran into a, a Kurdish intelligence officer who said that he had escorted Zawahri around Baghdad in 1983. Um, I don't have any further evidence that Zawahri has been uh, to Iraq. Is the Egyptian government still after him? Oh, yeah. I mean, one thing I guess people in this country don't understand is that Egypt has been suffering from the effect of this kind of terrorism uh, really since the early 90s. Uh, you know, been one attempt after another on the prime minister, on, on Mubarak. Uh, thousands of people have died in Egypt as a consequence of terrorism. Bombs, murders, uh, you know, if, if you think back to the, to the terrible events in 1997 in Luxor where uh, something like 80 people were machine gunned and um, it's just, you know, it's been, a, it's been a horrible plague in that country and the government of Egypt has responded with great brutality and thoroughness. Uh, crushing uh, the uh, the Islamist movement pretty much altogether inside that country. Next call for Lawrence Wright, Brooklyn. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, so Mr. Wright. I want to ask if uh, we have been fed the right information for the last year with the regards to the terrorist group. We have an administration. I am a Republican for many, many years. And I've watched this for many years. I regret that there's so many things being done against other nations with our tax money. And they keep saying it's the terrorists. We have administration that is, is uh, hungry for fuel. All of those guys there is looking to get the fuel out of uh, down by Saudi Arabia. They feel if they get the U.S. and Britain to, on one side and uh, and the U.S. on the other, will control the fuel and bring it in as they please and disregard. Israel it should have the right. Palestine people, everybody in this world should have the same right to live without nonsense. It's not too often that you could come over and bust a window out of my house without me going bust yours. And it went on for many years. I think it's time that we come to the real facts of life and do away with this war because going there to do away with uh, Saddam Hussein is not going to do nothing but escalate the, the, the East much, much worse than it is. And there's too many cells around. We could sit down at the table and get everybody together, draw up the conclusions and stop this nonsense, this slaughtering innocent people. It's, we're mighty, sure we are might, but our God is much mightier, and he knows which way it's going to go. The Bible must fulfill. They said before the end of time, it'd be wars and rumor wars, and we don't need this kind of nonsense. I agreed with Colin Powell and the, and the UN Kohanan to sit down at the table. Lawrence Wright, any reaction? Well, I wish that sitting down at the table was uh, the easy, you know, the practical solution. I don't know. Uh, we've sat at the table many times, and um, the uh, I think I'd like to separate the, you know, the war on terror and the prospective war on Iraq. Uh, there's no sitting down at the table with the terrorists. It's, you know, it's something that we have to. It's a, it's an action we have to finish, and it's going to take a long time. I think that it's. Um, wishful thinking to believe that you know the thousands of people that went through those training camps in Afghanistan uh, have been put to sleep by our actions. Um, that is something we're going to have to do, you know, with great commitment. Uh, unusual for this country. Uh, historically, we have not reacted with the kind of persistence that we need to. Um, the war in Iraq, I. I think it's an entirely separate issue, and I don't think it should be conflated. And I think it's unfortunate right now the conversation uh, in the capital all over the country is getting mixed up with these, you know, with this war on terror, which we have to pursue. The other one, I I don't take a stand on it. You know, I don't know enough about Iraq uh, 
to speak about it, but I do know that this particular war that we're engaged in right now, we have to finish. My notes say that you had a breakfast meeting at the White House yesterday. Yes. Well, that was uh, not with uh, the president. It was First Lady has a writer's um, group. You know, she honors uh, different American writers, and I was fortunate to have been included. Why were you included? For well, I what book? live in I, I live in Texas, and uh, uh, I've known the Bushes there, and uh, so we have a common interest in uh, literature. Uh, and uh, the First Lady's been just terrific in terms of promoting Texas writers, and so uh, she uh, she extended this offer for me to come to be a, a, just a, a member of the audience in this symposium on women writers in the West. Next call for Lawrence Wright, Arlington, Virginia. Good morning. Yes, hello, can you hear me? Sure can. I'd like to ask the writer, if you doubt, and do you doubt, that the Jewish Mossad had something to do with that? Uh something to do with? Uh, with 9-11. <clears throat> um, the only thing I can say about that is that uh, there was, uh, you know, there were a group of uh, Israelis who were arrested uh, I, maybe on 9-11, but or shortly thereafter, there was a um, a woman in New Jersey who heard the plane crash and uh, went out of her, you know, looked out of her apartment window at the, you know, the burning World Trade Center and heard some commotion in the street below. And she um, looked down and there were some people standing on top of a moving van who were, according to her, you know, slapping each other on the black back and doing high fives and videotaping themselves with the burning World Trade Center in the background. And so, you know, she had her binoculars. She looked down, got their license plate, and called the FBI. And um, these, um, it turned out to be all Israelis, and they had a moving com company. The, is the FBI opened a criminal investigation on them. When their nationality was discovered, it was changed to a counterintelligence investigation because the FBI believed that this might be um, an Israeli military intelligence group and who might have penetrated perhaps some cell, in, uh, Hamas cell in New Jersey. Uh, and then right after that they were deported. So more than that I can't say. It's a very um, anomalous thing. I don't know any more about it than that. Cape Coral, Florida, good morning. Good morning, Phil. Uh, one little question here. Uh, the uh, Wahhabism in Saudi Arabia has been very, very active for a long time, and I feel sure that some of this influence from there uh, led, helped to lead to the overthrow of the Shah. I was in Iran at that time, and I had been for five years, and uh, I saw myself uh, when the trouble was going on, people with guns coming out of the bazaar and they were wearing the Arab headdress that is common to Saudi Arabia. Uh, a lot of them at that time were given the name of Palestinians, but I feel sure that uh, they were possibly Saudi as well as Palestinian. And I also think that bin Laden is still alive and may be hiding out somewhere in south of Saudi, somewhere around between Salail and Kamis Mashaid in the mountains around there with the Yemenis. Uh, I, I do think that this uh, Al-Qaeda business saw its birth in Saudi with the Wahhabis long before the Shah was overthrown. And this, of course, I think affected your Egyptian friends and uh, the rest of it. Would you There's a... What I can say about this is that there has been a correspondence between uh, the Egyptians and the uh, Saudis that goes back to um, uh, Said Qutb, uh and uh, when he was arrested, uh, and many of the Muslim brothers, when they got out of prison, went to Saudi Arabia. And Said Qutb's brother, Muhammad Qutb, became a professor in Jeddah and uh, was one of uh, the professors of Osama bin Laden, for instance. So there, you know, there, the influence uh, has gone both ways. Certainly the, the Wahhabis have funded a lot of the uh, radical Islam that's grown up in the Arab world and all over the world. But the, um, uh, the Egyptians have also uh, influenced the, the conservative Islamic policies in Saudi Arabia themselves. 
Next call for Lawrence Wright, Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Good morning. Yes, uh, Mr. Host, don't cut me off. I want to ask you to get a couple of questions, then I want to make a comment. Mr. Wright, what religion uh, affiliation are you? I grew up in the uh, Methodist Church. You're a Christian? Yeah. Uh, do you know any, any radical Christians in this country or radical uh, Judah, Judah, Jews? I've, I've made a kind of specialty about writing about religion over the years. But what about radical Christians? I, never, I always hear you guys talk about radical Islams or radical Muslims. What about the, who are the radical Christians? Christian? Did y'all call McVay, uh, Timothy McVeigh a radical Christian? Did anybody call him that? Oh. Are you, you, aren't you, isn't it that you people, and I know that the press is owned by the Jewish, by Jewish people who are not in ethnicity but in religion, is it that you people are really at Islam and using radicalism to trying to get rid of Islam because it's one of the fastest growing religions in the world and it is overtaking Christianity, particularly among the non-whites? Isn't it that, and I know now the Arabs have gotten in bed with the Anglo-Saxons over the years and have stolen everything. They've done the same thing to black people that the Anglo-Saxons have. And now, they're, they're like dogs lie down, you lie down with dogs, you're going to get fleas. Now the, the Anglo-Saxons are back at the Arabs. And they, what they want to do now is they want to have one power, and that's a European power. Isn't it that you people have, in your radicals, your Osama bin Laden, of the Jewish people of uh, Israel, in that your bin Laden, where you give all the money to those radicals, and they go and do terrorism throughout the, the, the Arab world? And another question, sir, isn't it that the United States government, some of the people in the government, wants Israel to control uh, the whole Arab world is um, Well, let me talk about, first of all, I've studied uh, religion as a reporter for years and years, and um, there are radical elements in every religion, and there's a fundamentalist upsurge in every world religion right now. It's not just Islam. Certainly Christianity, and especially in this country, has a very strong fundamentalist element. and. Um, as does Judaism and Hinduism. And in almost every case that I can think of, this has led to confrontation and oftentimes bloody escalations uh, between these different groups. I think the whole world has, since the end of the Cold War, uh, the world has been divided not between capitalism and communism, but between the forces of modernity and the forces of tradition. And that's where these, you know, you can see it so clearly in Egypt, you know, or all over the Arab world where they're confronting modernity and the fear of losing the traditions that make them who they are uh, cause people to turn towards fundamentalism. It's an understandable uh, uh, sociological cause and effect. Um, and I don't single out Islam as being uh, unusual in having this radical fundamentalist element. It's just that right now we are in conflict with it. And um, but uh, you know, in Israel itself, that country is torn apart right now by uh, very conservative Orthodox Jews. That you know, some of them want to blow up the Dome of the Rock and so on. Uh, those kinds of radical elements are loose in every religion in this world right now. Well, back to your article in The New Yorker regarding Ayman al-Zawari. Uh, does Israel play a prominent role in his uh, formation? Yeah, he, you know, he hates Israel, hates Jews. Uh, he um, wrote a poem to his mother about Jerusalem while he was in prison. He, you know, he denounces uh, Judaism and, and uh, he even commissioned a study uh, on America uh, that uh, seems to have been a pretext for uh, targeting America for his Egyptian group uh, in, in order to get more money from bin Laden. And the conclusions were very similar to what the caller expressed, that uh, Jews are in charge of this country and uh, that the whole point of American policy is to make the world safe for Israel and therefore uh, it's right and proper for his group, which was Egyptian Islamic Jihad, to um, target America. And bin Laden was sufficiently pleased by this report to raise the budget of uh, the Egyptian Islamic Jihad to $500,000 a year. So, Who did the study for him? I don't really know. I mean, I, uh, 
I, those, they're, 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 I'm writing a book about this, Peter, and it, those are the kinds of questions that I, you know, the, the fill in the blank sorts of things that I've got to spend a lot of time, years probably, trying to figure out who, who is who in every one of these uh, departments. Next call, uh, Newcastle, Indiana. Good morning. Hi, how are you guys? Um, I don't really have a question as much as I have a comment. Um, and the nature of a lot of the calls this morning concern me. Um, you know, if a venomous snake invades your house, do you wait for him to bite before you do something about it? Uh, we got bit a little over a year ago, and it seems like a lot of the callers think we should be bitten again before we do anything. Um, the two or three callers ago, the guy said that the administration, I think, basically had this incredible need for oil. And I say to him, sir, so do you. Uh, you would not have been able to make your phone call this morning had it not been for oil, the plastic that your phone is made of, uh, the truck that brought the morning coffee to you for your breakfast. Um, my goodness, people, I'm, I'm glad our forefathers had more foresight than we seem to have now. Because if we just sit back and watch these people, they're going to do it again and again and again and again. It's time to act. And that's basically my comment. Mm. Um, there's a perception in the Arab world that there are only two poles of American policy, oil and Israel. And um, the um, and and those are important. You know that is the axis in much of our policy. You know there, uh, we have to make it clear that you know we. I think that um, America has failed in the Arab world. I want to make it clear. You know we impose standards on the rest of the world, especially in Asia and Latin America, to, for democracy. Um, and uh, we didn't do that in the Arab world because we were afraid of the results. And what I heard in, um, when I was in Egypt uh, recently is we're only asking for you to adopt the same standards for us that you have in the rest of the world. And I think that's a, that's a good point. We need to be supporting democratic elements in civil society all over the world, not just because, not just in places where we're afraid that we might lose our access to oil. Next call, Washington, D.C. Good morning. Hello? You're on the air. Hi. I would like to respond to some comments made by um, Mr. Wright. First of all, I'm, I'm a fan of The New Yorker, and I've read um, much of his writings in the past, and uh, I, I do find it very educational and informative. Um, I was shocked, though, at your response to the previous caller about the Israeli Mossad's and, uh, participation or alleged participation in the 9-11 attacks. Would you basically just infer it or help perpetuate as a rumor that another foreign government, a friendly one to ours, had previous knowledge of these attacks and or participated in them without giving the name of this woman the the identity of these people, any kind of background information of it. This is something that even um, the head of the Arab, Isra uh, Arab American Defamation League, Mr. Zagby, has said with, with when reported of, of Arabs slapping each other on the back uh, on top of a truck, uh, congratulating themselves, was a false rumor that he's spent time investigating. So I'm not sure where that kind of rumor comes from, but it's a very dangerous one, and I was very shocked that you as a journalist would simply just perpetuate it so so haphazardly, so backhandedly, without any kind of uh, any kind of information, um, I, I think the Israeli government would have some de serious arguments with you, and, and and that that kind of reporting. Do you have any any other information, some hardcore information that you could pass along to us on that? Well, the um, it's, it's not a rumor. This this did actually occur, and uh, the um, these people have you know there was a, a very interesting report on it on ABC. Uh, couple of months ago and uh, the people that were deported have been on talk shows in Israel talking about it uh, they claim they're not a part of a you know of an intelligence group I, I'm only reporting what actually happened I don't have an opinion about um, you know what they knew or I you know I was not trying to make an inference I'm only saying that that this did happen they were under investigation by the FBI they were deported and uh, beyond that I don't understand very much about it. I'd like to know more about it, but I, that's all I can respond to the caller. Marietta, Georgia, good morning. Hello. Um, I have a, a statement and a question. Uh, the first one is, uh, in your opinion, if we bomb Iraq, do you believe or can it happen that the radicals in Pakistan will take over and therefore get, get the atomic bomb? Um, the other thing is, uh, when uh, Powell met with the Israeli president, they had a conference in, in, uh, before the cameras in front of the world, 
And the president of Israel said that the capital of the United States is in Israel. I'm still waiting for the president to tell us that that's not a fact. That's all. I, I don't know anything about the second part of that. Uh, the, um, I will relate a conversation I had the other day with um, this uh, uh, official in MI5, which is the British um, equivalent of the FBI. And his concern is that with the, um, you know, the destruction of the sanctuary that Afghanistan was for al-Qaeda, uh, that the, the radicals in this movement will have no place to go, but they'll be stay, have to stay in their own countries where they'll be bottled up. Um, and their agitation will then turn more directly to the governments in their own countries, such as Pakistan and Egypt. And uh, that this could be, from an intelligence point of view, a really dangerous uh, turn of events. Because uh, if there was a, a radical takeover in Pakistan, uh, which is nuclear armed, uh, it could have devastating consequences. Uh, Bill Gertz writes this morning in the Washington Times that terror cells at liberty to strike, that Ramzi bin El Sheib, uh, the September 11th organizer who was just captured, uh, says Al Qaeda has decentralized its leadership structure, making it more dangerous. Is uh, the gentleman you write about, Ayman al Zawari, is he in control of Al Qaeda? There are some reports that he is. And um, he, he would be the natural successor to bin Laden. If bin Laden is dead or incapacitated, then, uh, then he's the guy that'd be running the show. Should uh, we be worried about al-Qaeda cells still? Yes. In the U.S.? Yes. We, we, we don't know the extent of you know, this network. Uh, it's been a shock, I think, to everyone to see how widespread it is all over the globe. And, uh, for instance, the, the arrest the other day in Lackawanna, I don't know. Uh, I've talked to people in the FBI about it, and they say that, you know, these guys did train in Afghanistan. We don't know exactly what they were up to, but, uh, you know, they were fighting another country's war, and we don't approve of that. But it, that's the kind of thing that we have to be much more vigilant about. And there, there may be other cells like that here. Whether there are cells present now, there may be people on their way, uh, you know, to, to do us harm either in this country or abroad. Next call for Lawrence Wright, Bronx. Good morning. Yeah, hi. I have two quick questions. The first one, um, do you think all Egyptians are terrorists? And the second one is, why is there a double standard um, when it comes to uh, Iraq and Israel about violating UN resolutions? They violated pretty much the same amount of resolutions. Why is there, why should we go bomb Iraq and not Israel? Um, I, I don't, I don't want to respond to the second part of it because I'm not really sure what would be accomplished by bombing Israel. But the um, let me say something about Egyptians. If if, if the, and maybe this caller is Egyptian, I lived in Egypt 30 years ago. I taught two years at the American University in Cairo and formed very deep, close ties to that country and to people there. And I love Egypt. It's very unhappy to me that um, that we've come to a stage of alienation that we have uh, not just with Egypt but with much of the Arab world and um, I um, do not think that all Egyptians are terrorists I think that they've waged a very valiant struggle against terrorism in their own country that some Egyptians are terrorists yes but I uh, would never want anyone to believe or infer from my comments that I think that all Egyptians or all Arabs or all Muslims are terrorists. I don't believe anything of the sort. Uh, would the Egyptians, are there free elections in Egypt? No, there, there are elections, but it's essentially an autocratic dictatorship. Uh, I think that all of political Islam is a kind of political bubble this form because of the lack of democratic outlets and the lack of civil society. There are many people who identify with political Islam that have completely different agendas than, uh, than their compatriots. It's just that they don't have the alternative party structures to 
pour their, you know, their political thoughts into. They have no way of expressing themselves politically. The only thing that happens in, in these autocratic dictatorships that are so common all over the Arab world, the only thing that the autocrats are afraid of is the mosque. And so it becomes a countervailing force that I think is very artificially inflated because there's so little in between. What's the level of crackdown with the Mubarak government uh, with regard to the Islamic fundamentalists? Oh, they've completely crushed them. And More so than Sadat or, or oh, Nasser? Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, in fact, now the, I think it would be fair to say that you know, there's, there's not really, uh, in terms of violent political struggle, there's very little of that in Egypt. It had all fled uh, the repression of the Mubarak government. And this note in the Washington Times, President Mubarak's son was named the third most powerful member of the ruling party's secretariat and assigned by his father to a new policy-making committee, shoring up his political importance. Next call, Chandler, Arizona. Good morning. Yes, good morning, uh, Mr. Wright. Um, I'm an American. I'm also a Saudi. And uh, I was taught uh, in Saudi Arabia uh, that uh, we do, they didn't teach us to hate Americans, first of all. And uh, Ayman al uh was kicked out of Egypt because uh, uh, for some reason he was kicked uh, out of Egypt. And Osama bin Laden was kicked out of, Egypt, uh, out of Saudi Arabia, too. Uh, my comment is um, about, uh, you were saying about uh, Saudi Arabia, that they go by uh, Wahhabism or Salafi. Um, I just want to make a correction. Saudi Arabia goes by the Quran. They follow everything in the Quran, and there's no difference. You know, there, there's no difference between Saudi Arabia or Iran. Or I know that uh, the majority of Ira Iranians are uh, Shia, but still, Saudi Arabia goes by the Quran. They don't go. They don't have different beliefs than other Muslims. Or um, and thank you, Mr. Wright. Thank you. I'm a big fan. Oh, thank you. I appreciate your call. I'd, I'd like to go to Saudi Arabia myself. I've been having trouble getting a visa. I, I want to go learn more about that country. I, I've never had the opportunity to go. Um, so I'm, if, Why would you have trouble getting a visa? Well, it's not easy to get into Saudi Arabia. You know, it's, uh, it's a tightly controlled uh, uh, country, and, and they, they, they're not really very encouraging of you know, visitors like me. Um, but I, I'm dying to go visit it and, and learn more about it. Lawrence Wright has been with The New Yorker since 1992 and is a recipient of the National Magazine Award. Next call comes from Montgomery, Alabama. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. A uh, question for you, uh, Lawrence. Uh, regarding Egypt and uh, al Zawahiri mm -hmm. as uh, Bin Laden and the Al-Qaeda development, what we have seen over the last few years, and especially what's accelerated since 9-1-1, is looking at the financial uh, networks that, we, that were and are utilized, and their connection to the Muslim Brothers. And uh, I would like to know if you've turned up in your investigations, especially in Egypt, uh, further evidence that uh, the networks that were set up going back to the 30s uh, in Egypt and using Switzerland as a base and elsewhere for these uh, financial movements that were ostensibly uh, or effectively underground over the years that apparently have been were tapped into by Al Qaeda. Uh, I would like to hear what you have learned regarding the Muslim Brothers, uh, please. Um, the Muslim Brothers uh, were formed in late 20s in, uh, in, in Egypt um, and became a kind of prototype for the Islamic movement throughout the Arab world. The, um, and they were s suppressed under Nasser um, and he thought that he had destroyed them and they just simply went into prisons and, and underground. When, um, when Sadat freed the Muslim brothers uh, their influence just grew startlingly, and the, um, they formed a, a kind of student group called the Gama Islamia, or Islamic group, um, which was uh, 
not nominally associated with it, but was really very closely tied to the Muslim Brothers. Tied philosophically and religiously. You know, they, they believed in um, preaching their word, for instance. They were an open, above-ground organization. And their leader was Sheikh Omar Abdul Rahman, uh, who we uh, know in this country as a man who was uh, the inspiration behind the first World Trade Center bombing in 1993. And he's in prison for uh, the conspiracy to bomb other New York landmarks, such as the Lincoln and Holland Tunnels, the United Nations, and the Federal Building in New York City. The, um, I think that there was a strong uh, connection between the Muslim Brothers and the Islamic group. Now, jihad is a different group, and this is the Wahri's group. It was not associated with the Muslim Brothers. And, um, it does not believe in preaching revolution. It has no confidence in the masses. It believes in, you know, military coups, you know, grabbing the reins of government, you know, in sudden surprise. And um, I think, you know, if I can make this distinction, money did go into Islamic group. I'll, if the Muslim Brothers are influential in that, I don't know that much about the flow of money from the Muslim Brothers, and that's another thing I'd like to find out when I do this book. But I think that the route would have gone through Sheikh Omar Abdul Rahman's group rather than Zawahri's. Next call, Los Angeles. Good morning. Yeah, good morning. I want to say that uh, the problem is not uh, Muslims. The Muslim people are good and bad like everybody else. The problem is Islam itself because Islam teaches a lot of radicalism and a lot of hate. And the Muslims or the Arab countries, whatever you want to call they don't look at themselves, see why is this going on? And they try to either, you say, Islam hijacked or Islam was taken out of context, and they blame everybody else for the problems. It's time for them to look at themselves. Why is Islamic countries so backward? Why are they all dictatorships? Why everybody converts to Islam, becomes fundamentalist, becomes terrorists? They have to look into their teachings before they start uh, blaming everybody else for their problems. I think it is a time for reflection in Islam and in the Arab world, and not just because of the violence that has come out of there, but because of uh, the fact that uh, in the whole world, uh, the Arab world has been so financially retarded, sociologically brought to a halt. Um, I don't blame Islam for that. I think that the, that the real problem is the lack of democracy. And I think that the, um, the United States could do a lot to encourage democratic movements in these countries and support civil society. I think that this can be done uh, in an Islamic country. If you look at Southeast Asia and Indonesia and places like that, the largest uh, Islamic country, they've had much more progress than the Arab world has had. So I, I really attribute it as a political problem and not a religious one. Lawrence Wright is the author of this article in The New Yorker, the September 16th issue of The New Yorker, the man behind bin Laden, talking about Ayman al-Zawari. Next call, Arlington, Virginia. Good morning. Yes, good morning. Uh, you mentioned uh, that uh, Mr. Uh, bin Laden and Mr. Zawahri uh, has some charisma. Uh, I would like to ask uh, about the source of your information about uh, Mr. Zawahri was sodomizing children. I don't see anything charismatic about this. And if it is the Egyptian intelligence or intel uh, government, uh, Egyptian government uh, sources, that's not credible at all to report in your in your uh, in your book because you know this creates gaps and misinformation to american people and answer also to the caller before me uh, why is the islamic uh, world is backward you, you know don't forget that this area has been colonized for centuries and you know the west uh, british and french and american always have interest in this area and that is causing a lot a lot of problems on the the subject of uh, this, you know, the episode in Sudan where um, the um, the young boys were sodomized, I'm not attributing that to Zawahri. That was Egyptian intelligence that did that. Um, there are numerous sources for this story. I've talked to um, a number of Islamists who 
know about the episode. There is trial testimony in Cairo to that same effect. And, uh, and it's not at all doubted in the American intelligence community. So I, I feel very confident of the truth of those allegations. What acts of terror have been attributed to Ayman al-Zawari throughout his life? His assault on Egypt began in 1993 when he attempted um, uh, to assassinate the Egyptian prime minister and following that the interior minister. Um, he failed in both cases. Uh, in one instance, the Islamic Jihad had a car bomb uh, that was intended for the interior minister and it actually killed a young schoolgirl named Shaima and um, injured 24 other people. Uh, they also killed a witness to that crime uh, to keep it from being prosecuted. So essentially he's in Egypt himself, it, it, the early years were you know unproductive. Uh, in 1995 he blew up the uh, uh, Egyptian embassy in Islamabad, Pakistan and killed a number of people there. Um, after that uh, his actions seem to have been folded more into Al-Qaeda. In 1993, for instance, uh, uh, Mohammed Atif, one of the Egyptians, was sent to Somalia uh, by bin Laden to see what could be done about uh, uh, fighting the American troops who were there in the aid effort, uh, in the famine relief effort. And uh, the Black Hawk Down battle uh, seems to have been tra you know, trained by Al-Qaeda people, by, by the Egyptian uh, elements of Al-Qaeda. and. Um, Beyond, after that, it was the embassy bombings and all that sort of thing in which uh, Zawahri was a part of. Was he tied to the 98 embassy, American yeah. embassy bombings? Yeah. His, uh, uh, Mohammed Atta, once again, uh, and uh, uh, Ali Muhammad, who is in prison here awaiting uh, sentencing, uh, sized up the embassies and gave reports about how it could be accomplished. Next call, Hoboken, New Jersey. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Uh, yes, it's absolutely right what Mr. Wright had said, that um, they were parked, uh, the uh, moving company, that turned out to be the intelligence officers of, of the uh, Israeli Mossad, they were parked, and then when the plane hit, they were filming it, and they were jumping for joy, and that's when the woman called the police, and they were stopped on the highway. And what had happened, the company folded up. They took off, leaving a lot of people high and dry, with their uh, possessions in storage and all, and they disappeared. So what he said is absolutely right. The other gentleman who called and said they were Arabs, no, they were Israeli. Now, if the Mossad knew something about this and uh, they did not say anything to us or shared with us, and they probably thought maybe a few hundred people would die, that's a total shame because it, 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 thousands died. But everything that Mr. Wright had said is true. They would. Okay, I got to cut you. We're running short on time. Yeah. Final comment. Uh, I don't know that these were intelligence people. All I know is that it was, you know, investigated as uh, an intelligence operation, and, and, and it was aborted by the deportation of the people that were involved. What would you like people to bring away from the article that you wrote in The New Yorker? I'd like for them to understand that this movement began years ago, that there are political reasons for it, and that uh, we can understand i mean there are 19 hijackers people can only name one we need to learn more this is the greatest crime in american history we need to understand where these people are coming from and what we can do in the future to counter it lawrence wright is a staff writer with the new yorker his article on ayman al Zawari is in the september 16th issue of the new yorker thanks for joining us Peter, this morning. thank you very much in just a few minutes the house is going to be in session i uh, want to let you know that tomorrow in the washington journal duncan hunter and ike skelton both members of congress and members of the house armed services committee where secretary rumsfeld is testifying will be here to take your calls also uh representative ray hall who just returned back from baghdad he will also be here to take your calls on the washington journal tomorrow two Live hearings that we're covering uh, were at 10 a.m. this morning. Secretary Rumsfeld in front of the House Armed Services.